Triathlon Smart. Ironman 70.3 Bustleton is a pretty special event because it's the end of the triathlon season in WA and it's an event that's been around for years and a lot of people put in a lot of training and time and effort to ensure they get a good race for Bustleton. It's been my goal to do well at Bustleton each season for the last nine years. It's my 23rd season racing as a pro athlete and I've been fortunate to race everywhere and at this point for me it's, it's not about world titles anymore, it's about doing the races that I actually want to do. Basildon 70.3 is a world class triathlon and also a community event. And it's just got a really great community feel that you don't get at a lot of races. Um, and certainly the crowd support is phenomenal. It's just a really beautiful part of the world and the location is spectacular. You know, we're spoiled living here in WA, having such a beautiful race and, and the, the locals really get behind it and support the race and make you feel welcome. And I just can't imagine not being here this time of year, you know. It's the place to be, I think, if you're doing triathlon. Just fantastic location for the race and it's a fantastic course. Basso as a town, is, it's a nice little town and it's cool just to see like um, someone who's not even into triathlon, they know the race is on for the weekend and they sort of get behind it and they'll get out for, a, you know, support you along the Esplanade there and it's something's going on and the, the community gets behind it. The number of internationals and, and Eastern States athletes really, really increased. It's really good to have people that you've, you know, you've never seen at a race before that have come from so far away and got so much experience and, and other ideas. It's really good and it really opens it up. from New Zealand and been racing triathlon since 2006 and I started doing short course racing and in 2012 I moved up to long course racing. Um, so I've been enjoying the longer stuff for the last few years now. It's certainly like a fine wine, like you get a little bit better as you get older and it's like athletics, so you just progress through the distance. You don't often start with long distance and come back to a shorter distance. So now I live in Australia, I'm just doing my little bit for the economy and I'm also dating uh, Police from WA and the travel side of things is definitely a big, you know, lure for us to keep racing and, and see what's out there. For me, uh, growing up in New Zealand, Basso kind of relates to a few of the sleepy towns there where it's, um, it's, it's nice and relaxed, it's got like a calm feeling about it. I love to come back mostly because it's the home of like my girlfriend and her family so we get to check in with them again. And uh, the trip for us, it's not just about the race, it's sort of checking out WA and the whole experience, the travel, the race, the post-race, um, and just running into like our peers and it's kind of a bit of everything and I enjoy it because it's such an individual sport that a lot of the time you're logging miles by yourself so now we can cross paths and compare stories. I'm Elise. I started triathlon back in 2011. Loved the sprint tries, then worked my way up to Olympic distance racing and half Ironman racing in the age groups um, before qualifying for my pro license. And um, yeah, been racing pro for the last 18 months or so. And yeah, have a look back. Bustledon and the southwest of WA holds a really special place in my heart. I've Growing up in Perth area and fortunate enough to have a family that of the southwest. So to return to Bustleton to race, it just feels like I'm coming home in a way. Uh, I love the Chuart Forest, I love that whole area, I love Geograph Bay. It's really special to me and that's what keeps me coming back every year. My name's Katie Gibbs. 
Um, I'm a professional triathlete from Western Australia. I started my triathlon career probably about nine years ago as just an age grouper, uh, as part of the women's triathlon at the Holden WA. Uh, and then over the years, I've moved up to becoming a professional triathlete. So I uh, got my professional license in late 2014. And since then, I've been racing mainly in Australia in some Asian races as a professional triathlete. Personally, I like to keep pushing myself in triathlon to see how fast and far I can take myself. You know, I enjoy the fitness and I enjoy racing and training with my friends. It's one of those few sports where you can race and train with men and women. Um, there's not many sports where you can actually race men on the same course and that's what I really enjoy about it. There's no discrimination between um, sexes. That's the best part of the sport. Bustleton to me was, it was my first 70.3 eight years ago. Uh, when I was an age grouper, I did it on a road bike and I actually did quite well. And that's when I really fell in love with the sport, especially the half distance racing. Seeing those pro women win the race and race was something that I thought one day it'd be pretty awesome if I could be one of those women and maybe even win it one day. Probably the toughest part is pushing through that pain because it does hurt. What I use to get me through a race is that the only way off a course is through the finish line. So if I want to get off the course and get this over with, it has to be through the finish to shoot. There's no other way to finish it. I sort of see it as a almost like a mental jail in that the, the only door out is through the end. My name's Peter Taylor. I'm the commander of the Bustleton Volunteer Marine Rescue Group. At Ironman 70.3 Bustleton, the group's role is to monitor the swimmers in conjunction with SLAWA, Surf Life Saving. Also keep an eye on any marine hazards that might be around at the time. We also have DFibs and Oxyvivas on our boat in case they're needed. The crews are trained in senior first aid as well. So if we're required for any assistance with a person in trouble, we can always help them. The boys enjoy it out on the water, there's no doubt about that, especially when it's calm and there's no incidents that we need to attend. We have two vessels. One, um, at, as you can see at the, at the back of me, is our fast response vessel. It's got all the up-to-date electronic equipment. The vessel's got two 250 MAA outboards, which gives it a top speed of around 54 knots. I volunteer because um, I like the camaraderie with, with um, the rest of the members. The other thing I do enjoy is going out and rescuing people. We don't expect anything in return as a volunteer for what we do. That's just part of our job and we enjoy doing it. I'm happy to live here. Who wouldn't be when I look out over here and see the bay at the moment in May, it's flat calm and the guys are gonna have a great swim tomorrow. Swim League starts at 7 o'clock. We'll be using Channel 6 with swim control and also we'll be monitoring our emergency channels as well. We'll have media on board the boat as well, so try not to get in their way. <laughs> the swimmers are looking to us for some assistance if they need it. So just keep your eyes and ears open and pass on any messages that you need to. Okay, thank you. Let's go. Uh, we just dropped off our crew two at the marina get on um, our second rescue vessel. The conditions will be perfect for the swimmers and also for us as well. Now heading out of the marina to the start line, we'll make contact with um, the swim control at the triathlon and take instructions from them.
bit of nervous energy there, a bit of a buzz. Uh, I really enjoy the sort of uh, the, the change that you, as you're setting up your bike, there's, you, you know, 60 year olds and 70 year olds or, or whatever, you know, people from all sort of, you know, with different goals and, and different aspirations all setting up their stuff and getting to race as well. So um, sort of feed off that, uh, that enthusiasm and buzz is um, something different for me and uh, I really enjoy it, yeah. A bit nervous, excited, yeah. yeah. Just ha I'll be happy once I get on the run. The rest of it, I just got to get through. A few hours away, but yeah, that's how it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit lost. Don't know what I'm doing really, but uh, we'll see. I think I signed up for this as a bet. <laughs> So the, the beach start on Bustleton is probably one of the best starts you can get uh, in the in the 70.3 or particularly the triathlons in Australia. If it's a good year, the, the swim is completely dead flat and it's quite a, a simple swim. It's not a technical, it's pretty much you, you head out to sea, you do a, a quick right hand turn and then you come back straight back to shore. The swim was beautiful. It was obviously an early morning start, um, had the clear goggles on and you know, it's it was actually, I didn't swim. Um, swam out in there before and it was, you know, it's pretty nice and the, you know, it's again, it's one of those things that sort of get a little bit sidetracked sometimes even in the middle of a race and, you know, the sandy bottom and then it changes at different depths and then you come back around again, but it was, it was like a swimming pool really. I, honestly, I didn't really feel too nervous about it. I think it's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, lot, a lot longer day, I think. You know, the first 100 metres in the swim isn't as crucial when you're about to go out and race the guys for four hours. The swim is it's generally, it's not somewhere where the race can be won, but you know what's required to uh, put yourself in the race, and that's to, uh, to get underway and, and, and find white water, and just sort of like a, a school of fish. Uh, so I got off to a, to a decent start. Um, it's a bit hard to know exactly what's going on, you know, like uh, your, your goggles are usually starting to fog up and um, all you can see is white water and feet. And I could feel someone tapping at my feet when I, when I drift back to a second, so I knew that there was at least three of us there, but um, beyond that it's, it's pretty hard to tell, um, you know, whether you've got a pack of 20 on you or, or it's just the three of you. Uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a perfect sit on, I think it was Dan or Ryan's feet and um, yeah, set myself up really well for a good race with, with, a, with a good solid swim. You know, it worked out well for me. I was able to wade out and I think I was second or third uh, for the first two or three hundred metres and I settled into about third or fourth spot. And really, the, it felt quite comfortable. And it, often it does when you're towards the pointy end. When you're at the front, there's a lot more swimming than wrestling. Back in the pack, it can be more of a melee and um, everyone fighting, for, jostling for position. But towards the front, it's, it's really that's where the gentlemen swim. Well, that's the saying anyway. Getting ready to race, there's always some good banter on the start line amongst the girls. You know, we're all super competitive and we all want that win when it comes to race day, but we can always have a bit of a giggle and a bit of a joke on the start line. It's, it's probably more to calm each other's nerves than anything else. 
I knew that there were some really strong girls swimming uh, who are strong swimmers, so there's obviously Elise who's a great swimmer. My um, plan was to try to, being a sort of middle of the pack swimmer, I'm not super strong but I'm not weak, was to make sure I got in with the, the top girls uh, out of the water. So I actually had quite a good start. Yeah, it was just a mad flurry of arms and legs. A couple of the girls went out really hard at the start of the swim. I made the move to go around them and try and put on a bit of a surge to drop them. But yeah, managed to, to drop the girls and come out of the water with about a 15 second lead, which I was happy with. Um, swimming's my strength, so I was, yeah, it was kind of um, my plan to go out really hard in the swim and get that little breakaway if I could. Swimmers have had an excellent start. The weather's been great, as it usually is down there. Um, all looks pretty good for a fast finish, I'd say. Communication-wise, we have a radio controller in our tower, keeping an overall eye on the boat. We also have radio contact with our other vessel and chip to shore base radio contact with Surf Lifesaving who are the um, on-scene controllers for the water event in the Ironman. Um, as you can hear, there's probably a bit of banter going on now. Nice and flat day, so it's pretty good for us, and the swimmers seem to be having an easy time getting around. I saw one just go on a jet ski, but nothing for us. Oh, mate, these two jump in before I do. Look at I've got to go down with the ship. Let's have it away. Picking up the photographer for the underwater scene. Can't get a better morning than this, eh? <laughs> Can't do it now, it's probably about three seconds. <laughs> uh, it's been a great year. Hopefully the guys will have a good bike ride and a good run and um, we'll catch us all next year. Have a good day. Race morning was like yesterday morning and the morning before, just perfect. It's like a postcard, you know, watching the, the water and the pier, you know, just the sun glistening. It's been, it's been ma magic here the last few days. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's a beautiful part of the world. And to be honest, during the race, you're not really taking it in. But in, certainly in the days leading up and afterwards, you definitely are. And um, that's one of the reasons that I came back. It was such a nice experience, not only winning the race, but just the whole everything in and around the race, the community and the location here, the scenery, it's just, it's spectacular. I mean, some of the best sunsets I've seen the last few evenings having, having dinner with friends and it's just a really beautiful part of the world. And you know, they, at this point in my career, there are things that can sway you one way or the other, whether you go back to a race. You know, it's a pretty amazing place. You know, coming here for the first time, it sort of sets it high, but no, I love it. It's, Almost like a, there's a place at home that it sort of reminds me of. It's just like a sleepy sort of seaside town, and you know it's beautiful. You know, Western Australia, there's such, there's so much to explore for us with Margaret River, and it is a bit of a destination race. Flying into a big city such as Perth, and then we're driving down to like a, a little place such as Bustleton, and I don't know, I just enjoy that travel side of things. It gets you out and about. Uh, so this is my first time to uh, Bustleton and Perth and Western Australia all in one. I've never been over to the West Coast. But I've certainly heard about Busso with the, with the 70.3 and the Ironman here in the past. And um, there's been some real icons that have come over here and, and won here. So it's a pretty uh, 
pretty famous area for triathlon in Australia. So, um, so yeah, finally it fitted in with the schedule this year. Uh, it's really nice. Um, I had no expectations really because uh, I didn't know too much about the place apart from that they got a pretty big uh, jetty over there, which um, which was pretty impressive. But um, but yeah, it's a it's a really nice place. Um, beautiful place to, to, to hang out and, um, and the people are really friendly as well so I've been enjoying my time here. I've never been to WA before and you know I, li I like racing in Australia and you know this was a perfect opportunity. I was a bit of a late a late entry. Um, to the race and I was looking at America and all these different options and my coach sort of he's like you know why don't you just go over to Busso and I was like actually yeah I don't you know I don't know why I didn't think of that you know I love the beach and the coastline and everything and I think the jetty and you know it's sort of iconic I'd always seen photos of it in the past even though never having been here so it is yeah it's cool you know last year um, the Rio Olympic Games was something that I guess I've always thought about um, not Rio specifically but making Olympic Games was a, a lot of my drive through doing triathlon, that was sort of the pinnacle in my mind of what I wanted to do in the sport, what I wanted to achieve. Uh, so my name's Michael Lidlow, I'm a triathlete. I love triathlon, absolutely love it, it's a great sport. Uh, I've been doing triathlons for 27 years now. This is my 15th um, WA long course. Um, I started back when I was uh, over at Rodnest Island, um, back in the early 90s. And this year is even uh, more more special. Um, I've managed to convince all my kids to, to come along and have a go with us. And, uh, and here we are. So the oldest one's Connor, um, his second half Ironman. And then Sinead's the next one. Um, it's her second half Ironman as well. Uh, Caitlin, it's her first, first go, very first go, but she's run a marathon before, so, so she'll be right for the distance. And then Aiden is the youngest, and it's his second half Ironman. <laughs> Oh, that was so good. Uh, well, my name's Caitlin Lidlow. I am, I wouldn't say I'm a triathlete. This is my first ever half Ironman triathlon. So Dad started me riding to and from work, which is probably the best way, just try and get the Ks up, get a bit more confident. Although if I do get a flat tomorrow, I, die, I won't be able to change it. I'll just have to wait for Dad to come back around and then he can change my will for me. Um, but, <laughs> don't laugh. Um, but no, he's, yeah, he's, because he's got so much experience, just every single question you have about anything and the tactics, Dad just knows it, so he's really good for that, yeah. Well, the reason I was so reluctant to do the triathlon in the first place, even though everyone else is doing it because I just was not comfortable with the swim at all, I've never really been a good swimmer at all, never really tried it too much. Um, but obviously when you have to do a 1.9 kilometre swim, you just kind of got to embrace it. And then one day Dad just said, you have to come down to Coogee, you need to get in the water, in the ocean, and just get used to it. I'm still not a great swimmer by any st stretch of the imagination, but now I can actually get in the water and not absolutely freak out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did I lie about? There's been different levels of commitment and training between the four of them. Doing you know, all those early morning training sessions, doing a couple of lead up races, and then all the, the trash talk that's been going on. Uh, you know, Sunday night dinners and everyone will be talking about who's going to beat who, and, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Six. No turning back now, guys, you know that, don't you? <laughs> So this is the official event program for 2017. It's got lots of information, all the competitors are listed. Um, luckily there's a picture in here of me and the family um, and a bit of our story. Uh, it's all a bit embarrassing but it's uh, a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm hoping that Dad will DNF because that's the only way that any of us are going to beat him. So what we're going to do now is, uh, is go and check our bikes in, go home, relax all afternoon, take it easy and be right for tomorrow. I really enjoyed the, the lead up to this race so much more than any other year. It's getting a bit embarrassing. I'm almost 50 and, uh, and I'm still out in front of them. So, so they, they need to lift their game. <laughs> um, I'm certainly going to enjoy the, uh, the drinks afterwards if, uh, if I manage to beat them again. <laughs> hey, have a good day, everyone. What a lot of first timers here today. I guess we sort of had the feel that there was a, probably about five or six of us um, out of the water together. So I ran up, you know, tried to take that transition you know, relatively quickly and, and get out and away on the bike. And um, uh, I think I led through probably the first 
15 to 20k of the bike and um, just try to, to, to set a reasonable pace early on um, to a, a sort of establish you know, our, our position on the front. You know, the bike was beautiful. It was, it was probably the best way for me to see Bustleton, to be honest. Um, you know, riding out, you have the coast on the left, um, on the left-hand side, and, and again, then the further out you go, and it's sort of the landscape changes, and you sort of go into the forest as such, and the, um, the temperature dropped a few degrees, and it was pretty chilly, but, you know, it was beautiful. But I, I felt like I settled in quite well. Um, and obviously, I wrote to a degree right off power, but at the same time, you know, it's a race there, so you know, you're not necessarily just gonna let guys go either, or, um, and I tried to, I guess, and again, coming from that style of stuff at the start, it feels so, so controlled to, to what I'm used to doing, where normally it's pretty flat out, um, and then it's just that slow feeling of getting worse and worse for the next however many hours. Well, again, I think one of the little nuances with the racing the last couple of years with a lot of the short course guys coming up is the transitions are quick now and they're very important. So I knew it, import, it would be important to get, get through transition quick and out onto the bike and I think I was third or fourth onto the bike. And a group of five of us formed, I think, very quickly. Uh, and the pace wasn't really quick early. I think there was a sense that there would be a couple of guys, stronger guys from um, joining from behind. And Cal Millwood did, he, he rode up to us quite early, maybe 10 or 15 kilometres in. And, and that seemed to be the group then. Um, and the pace really lifted after that. So there was a lot of jockeying for positions. Yeah, so I got on the bike, I was at the back of the lead group, um, but I probably had about 10 or 15 seconds to catch up. I just had to work pretty hard to catch up and I'd made a little goal for myself to catch them before we got to the roundabout on Chewett Drive and uh, I had caught that 20 seconds up, but it's funny how that 20 seconds takes like, you know, 15 kilometres to catch up and when everyone's riding 40, 45k an hour, it's, it's difficult. It's fast out there, the road surface is really quick and, um, and we were riding really quick so um, yeah, I was just sort of uh, yeah, keeping an eye on fish and crowy and, um, and trying to get through it as, as best I could. So we finished the first lap in a little over an hour and um, you know we're on pace for a pretty fast uh, bike time uh, and then yeah I overshot one of the roundabouts on the second lap and um, then I had to put in a bit of an effort to catch back up and my wheels fell off like I just I took on the grand piano pretty quick and I just I tried for a few minutes to catch back up and uh, then I just sort of it's funny how you just, you go from feeling really good to sort of conceding that, you know, maybe, you know, it's almost in a bit of an internal battle. So unfortunately I pulled the pin and, um, which, you know, it's in hindsight, you go back and forth on your emotions about that a lot, if it's a good idea or a bad idea. But as a pro, uh, there's a lot of things to consider with other races around the corner. My wheels just fell off. So there's a crater about 5Ks along the side of the road there, where it all ended, but, yeah. Uh, then jumping onto the bike uh, out of transition, um, it was Jackie and myself, uh, Elise had already sort of made a bit more of a gap, but she had some issues getting on the bike. I think she had some wardrobe malfunctions with her shoes. I actually had a bit of a Cinderella moment at the start of the bike leg, so I went to jump on my bike and my shoe fell off out of my <laughs> out of my pedal. So my shoe was on the ground 10 metres back there. I had to jump off my bike, go back and get it, which um, 
I haven't done that probably since my first or second triathlon, so again, it was um, a bit of a rookie moment. Uh, my plan was to just put my head down and just ride as hard as I could and get to the Tuart Forest and see who could actually, or who had actually hung on. So that was my plan and I did it exactly how I was meant to. And I got to the Tuart Forest and I turned around and there was no one there. So uh, I didn't want to risk my chances of anyone catching me. So I just kept riding at that pace pretty much for the rest of the ride. I rode the last 15k solo and as hard as I could and uh, yeah, didn't see anyone else for the rest of the ride as far as the girls go. <laughs> I'm just good at suffering, I'm not very fit. Yeah, my name is Jerry Cheranai. I come from uh, Phuket, uh, which is in a small island in, in, in Thailand. Yeah. And I come here the first time to do the Ironman 70.3 Basenthal. I'm really excited. The city up here is, is, is look more calm and relaxed compared to where I come from, which is near to Patong, Phuket. We have ocean around, same like, like Australia, like Basenton here. There's so many trialists around. So this is what I see is different from uh, where I come from. Yeah, when I was start like 10 years ago, uh, that time was like 100 trialists, which is the whole country, very small number. And in the past two years, I can see like a number of Thai people, like 1,000 triathletes. We, we have seen a lot now. This is my sport. This is the real sport. And I'm falling in love in this sport. I keep training and I keep racing and I keep doing it, repeat day, every day. And I feel not bored at all. I went to Malaysia, I went to Singapore, I went to Ironman, uh, Philippines, Vietnam, and many triathlons in Thailand, more than 20 races a year. My holiday is like traveling and racing. Many people talking about, oh, race, you should come to Basenthal. This is this is very, very good court. Uh, you can set your PB. It's very nice temperature. I, and I do believe them, that's why I come here. I'm ready for this race and, and, and I'm ready to release all my power on the Sunday. Uh, I have always have a good memory with the triathlon. Everybody like friendly, you know, we help each other, we, we support each other and the new friend and new, you know, new worlds. Going on to the run, you know, running out, I, I, you know, I felt alright. I knew I was going to struggle a little bit, I think. I haven't. I probably just don't have the miles in the legs to run that sort of distance off that sort of bike, really. Um, but at the same time, you know, like, I, again, I, I was confident um, and I, I pretty much did exactly what I expected I'd be able to do today. You know, lap by lap, I, you know, I could feel myself um, going downhill, but, you know, I was trying to concentrate on simple things. And again, you know, I think it was the end of the first lap and I felt like I'd been running for 15K and I was breaking it down and I was, you know, I'm, one third of the way there and, and then try to just, I guess, pull it back. Yeah, running out of T2, I, I, I came in in great position. I think I was third in um, and certainly didn't waste any time. But you dropped my sunglasses running out, but I mean, that, that can happen. It, it's a little annoying, but it certainly doesn't affect, affect you at all. I guess at my age, it's just hard when the hamstrings are already tight to have to bend down and pick it up. That was the main thing. I ran out right next to Dan and we were only a handful of steps behind Ryan and Mark, so. Um, you know, I was close enough if, if I was good enough. I was certainly in the position I needed to be in. So after about a kilometre, I decided to um, drop a hammer and have a crack and, uh, and push the pace there and, and got a little gap on, on fish and then, then Crow was a bit off the back there as well. So, um, you know, once the gap was there, I you know, figured, you know, I was, I was committed to this and I, and I was in, in deep. So, um, so, yeah, I just put the head down there and, and went for it. And Dan wasted no time, certainly, in um, really vapour trailing us. He, his run today was just so impressive. Um, he looked smooth, he looked relaxed, and he kept a really high pace the whole time. Really didn't let up at all.
spectacular run course here. You're right there next to the water and, um, and then the little bit of bush between the sand and, and the path. It was, um, you know, it screams Australia out here. And um, volunteers and spectators at the aid stations were, were pretty special. There were a couple of guys playing some pretty loud music out there and um, dressed up as, I don't know what they were dressed up as, but some sort of furry animals. There's always every year some guy, and this year there was actually three of them all playing drums and playing music, uh, dressed in a gorilla suit, which is, it always puts a smile on your face and you always see everyone run just that little bit faster when they see uh, some guy in a gorilla suit on drums, because you don't see that often, especially in the triathlon. The support out on course is, there is no other race I've been to so far, uh, I can in, probably include the World Championships that I've been to, that would match the type of support and the feeling that you get on course at Bustleton. I'm Riley, I'm from Queensland originally and then I moved to Perth after I finished high school so I could study. There wasn't anywhere in Queensland where I really wanted to study so I thought I'd come back here because I really love being here. Um, and then I always wanted to do a half Ironman. I wanted to do one before I turned 18 but as I looked it up you have to be 18 to do it. Being from Queensland, I've always really heard of this race, especially within the like, triathlon community. It's been such a, it's a great race. Bustleton's a fast course because it's flat, it's smooth. We went on a ride this morning and the bike was just beautiful. It's amazing. And then running along the beach is the run course. You even get to swim next to the jetty. Even where we're staying now, it's just, the views are amazing. It's just the best place to race, I reckon. Well, I've been told that I'm the youngest female competitor of this race and um, it's something I like to push myself to do. For my age, I like to try to do something remarkable, I guess. So when I was 15, I did my first Olympic distance and um, I just keep pushing. Even though triathlon's an individual sport, you still have a great team behind you. Um, so, my mum's a triathlon coach, she started that a few years ago. This year she's brought eight of us here competing part of Tractivate. I found um, a passion uh, for triathlon when I moved to Western Australia from the East Coast in 2009. I learned to ride a fast bike, I learned to swim without flippers and I, you know, um, learned to run further than five kilometres. I moved back to the East Coast and I found a great club and from there we identified a real lack of women in triathlon in which uh, um, my whole goal was to be able to inspire more women to, to do triathlon. Uh, I did this triathlon last year with my daughter, um, loved it so much, I went home and wrote a story about it, told it to the tribe and this year Ironman 70.3 in May, we've got eight women, you know, here giving it, giving it a bell from Mackay. It's a group that, that challenge each other on a daily basis, that support each other and encourage each other. So it's an individual sport that's become a, a team sport basically. This morning we went for a ride on the road and everybody took a big deep breath and went, oh my gosh, look at this road, it's amazing. It's like, let's go ride to another beach, you know, there's just beaches everywhere. We're just surrounded by beauty. Uh, Riley and I have always had a really great relationship. She's a little bit crazy, but she's a little bit me as well. Um, you know, I watch her push herself and enjoy training, so, and she loves being surrounded by the others as well. I love everything about triathlon. I love the community. I love the people. I love the challenges. I'm not much of a swimmer. You know, many a times I'm like the last one out of the water, but as soon as I get on the bike, I'm breaking free. As soon as I'm running, I'm running towards the finish line. You know, I'm surrounded by seven amazing people, you know, on this journey to Bustleton, and it keeps on taking us further and further all the time. Probably at the last U-turn, I knew that the the gap was pretty pretty comfortable, which was good because I was I was pretty knackered by that stage. <laughs> yeah, coming down the chute, you know, people are throwing high fives, and the, it's just a really awesome feeling. Um, you know, triathlons are a pretty tough sport, and um, and winds, you know, they, they they don't pop up every day, so it's a, it's 
I really, you know, enjoy savouring that uh, that experience, and yeah, I, I was pretty pumped to, to take the win. Uh, I, I didn't know about the the course record until I sort of got into the thick of the crowd, and um, you know, a lot of people started yelling out to, to to have a crack at it. So, um, so that was good to yeah, really soak up that crowd over the last kilometre. They were they were really buzzing and getting into it, which was uh, which was pretty unreal. And then. Um, yeah, heading down the chute, uh, you know, I heard that um, that I was on the pace to, to break the record, so that was a, you know, a nice little cherry on top as well. Here he is, Simon. He's going to break the record. He's going to do it. Wilson has lifted to the applause of the bus of a crowd. He comes towards you now, Simon Beaumont. All right, guys, let's bring him in. A new champion for 2017. You know, I think after the race, you do have a, a bit of a debrief in your own mind of, of what went on. I've been around long enough to know now that you, you, can't, you can't change the results. So you don't, I don't agonise over things, but certainly if there's something you can learn from a race or things that happen, I mean, you're never too old to learn, as they say, and it's just gathering more information moving forward to the next one. But overall, yeah, I, I think I did everything I could today. So, I mean, that's a, that's a nice feeling to have as an athlete that, Yes, I didn't win, but I put forth a, a good performance and a worthy title defence, and you know, I'll leave Busselton happy in the knowledge that I prepared well and raced well. I was, I was really happy with today. I think I did that. I sort of broke it down and I was fairly controlled and I used, you know, used the pace that I wanted to for the first five or 10K, um, and the wheels fell off a little bit, um, and you know, I. I wasn't a great performance, but at the same time, I think, you know, it's realistically, it's where I was at, and I still finished the race, and I couldn't possibly have done anything better than what I did, and I think that's, you know, it's cliche, but it's the most important thing, you know, what you do on the day, if that's all you can do, it's, you know, you can't really be too disappointed. Two years ago, um, I was on a training ride. Every Saturday, I used to go up and meet friends up in Kalamunda. Uh, and my boyfriend at the time, Brent McSwain, would uh, finish his night shift and finish work at about seven o'clock and meet me at the end of my training ride up at Kalamunda Roundabout, and then we'd ride home. I was waiting for him at the usual nine o'clock spot, um, and he never turned up, which was quite unusual because he was one of those people that always you know, turned up on time and uh, was never late, and if he was, he'd let me know called his phone and there was no answer, but being an aviation fireman, I thought, oh, maybe something happened at the airport and he was held up and obviously they can't carry their phones with them. Stuff like this happened, so I went for my usual run off the bike, but when I got back to home at about, would have been 11.30, I tried to call his work and um, they said, look, he's, he left a normal time on his bike and headed off. And I was starting to get a little bit worried. I thought it was a bit strange. I jumped in the car to backtrack the way that he would have ridden. And at that point, I actually heard on the radio that there'd been a fatal accident with a cyclist in Welshpool. Um, and at that moment, I got that cold feeling and I thought it matched exactly what Brent would have been doing. So I called his mum and stuff like that and they hadn't heard anything. It wasn't until about two o'clock in the afternoon that the police actually turned up to my house to let me know that the cyclist killed in Welshpool was Brent. Uh, and in that moment, my whole life changed. I was only 27 at the time and I had no idea what to do. One person that had got me into triathlon, who I'd met through triathlon, was no longer there and it was, yeah, it was one of the toughest points in my, in my life and probably always will be. Found out that Brent was just riding home. He was in the far left lane and it was a drunk driver who swerved across the road and hit him from behind. So Brent was killed instantly um, and the guy drove for another 15 minutes uh, before he crashed the car on Row Highway. He didn't even stop to see if Brent was okay, but one of the things I take away from it was that Brent didn't see it coming. He was in no pain, he wouldn't have felt it. He was a huge part of my life, and especially when I first started triathlon. He, he was always there, even when he wasn't doing the sport for about two years, he always came to every one of my races. He was the one who said, you know, take, take your pro licence. I wasn't confident about it, but he said, you know, take it. What have you got to lose? Like, you can only prove to yourself how good you can get. He contributed a huge amount to my progress in the sport. But even now when I'm racing, I have, you know, I remember in my head what he used to say about how I should ride the bike or, you know, how I should do the run. The one thing that stood out for me in that time was the support of people in triathlon. Because it gave, gave me something to get up for. 
and it meant that I wasn't isolated. I had people to talk to and to be honest, it's one of those times where you just want to crawl up into bed and just never get out again. It was a tough, tough time. I made sure that the first lap of the run, I actually haven't done a huge amount of running due to some knee issues. So although I'm a strong runner, I wasn't quite sure how I would go doing a hard run. Uh, so my game plan was to pretty much run as hard as I could for the first lap to maintain or make a bigger gap with some of the work girls behind me. Uh, the second lap, I, I backed it off just to make sure that if anyone caught me, I had something left in the bag to, you know, push it towards the end. What about this? Folks, our leader on the road, Katie Gibb comes past the top of the duty tube now. She looks fantastic. Yeah, so I came into T2 and I was in fifth place. Uh, there was eight girls that started on Sunday, so uh, it was a bit of a decision I had to make on the spot as to whether to start the run or not. Um, given that I've had an injury. So I started running, I actually felt really good for about 15 minutes. Obviously, once you've had a stress fracture, it can be quite damaging to just go and run a 21K run. Uh, yeah, walk jogged a lot of the run and I actually had a blast. High five everyone and cheer everyone on the run course. And, you know, usually being so competitive, you don't get the opportunity to just really soak up the run atmosphere and enjoy it. So I thought I'm finishing this race regardless and I had an absolute ball just encouraging everyone on the way. I'd been in the lead the whole day uh, and I just didn't, did not want to lose it with the last 3k to go. I can safely say I've never ever pushed myself that hard on a run before, um, but the feeling of relief when I finally crossed the, the finishing line and got the finishers banner was something, um, it was surreal and it was something I didn't really expect. Down the finisher shoot or the last couple of k, I definitely felt that Brent was with me. I mean, I've actually never cried crossing a finishers line before and I'm not like a super emotional person or <laughs> crying person, but um, just, it was almost like relief. All that years of work and that promise that I'd made to myself years ago that I would one day be a winner at Bustleton, um, it all came out. Yeah, it was one of the most special days of my life, I think. Yeah. 